Well, it's good to be with you this morning. It's really good to be in church. It's been three, I missed three Sundays in a row. So for those who didn't know, I tested positive for COVID um, a few weeks ago. And uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone who reached out, prayed for me. I had many uh, people send me messages, texts, and everything. I'm happy to announce that virtually my family was relatively unaffected by it. We had an extremely mild case, um, really extreme mild uh, symptoms, uh, and very thankful for your prayers. I would encourage us all to continue to pray for this nation, continue to pray for our researchers, the scientists, the um, doctors, nurses, those who are combating this. And we need uh, healing in this land physically, but also spiritually. And so just to echo what Nicole shared with us and challenged, let's pray. We don't need to be a people of fear, but we do need to be a people of prayer. And I believe that combats a lot of fear. This morning, I get the privilege of starting a new series called Minor Characters. And during the month of August, you're going to hear a lot of sermons um, that are highlighting people that might be a little bit lesser known in the Bible. And today, I'm going to be talking about a man that God revealed himself to him And through that, this man changed the eternal destiny of his family and his nation. And I believe with my whole heart that God wants to do the same for you this morning. I believe that God wants to make himself known so that your family and those that you have influence over in this nation might be directed in a path towards heaven and have an eternal impact. He's mentioned in Numbers chapter 10 as Hobab. How many have heard of Hobab? He's mentioned in Exodus chapter 2 as Raul and called Raul in Exodus chapter 2. How many are tracking with me? His most popular name and what many of you probably know him as is Exodus chapter 3 where he's referred to as Jethro. And I'm not talking the restaurant, although that's what I'm going to call him the rest of this sermon because one, it's his most popular name of the three. And two, some boneless wings, mac and cheese, waffle fries inside of ranch to dip sounds amazing right now. And I'll tell you what, after preaching up a storm in the eight o'clock, I'm about ready to preach up a storm here and I'm going to do it my best to preach up a storm at 11. I'm going to have an appetite and I, Jethro sounds really good. So if anybody's buying, I'm coming. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to Exodus uh, chapter 2, and I want to do some filling in for you. Uh, Exodus chapter 2, um, I'm going to get teachy for a while, but I have to uh, because uh, the Bible really doesn't say a whole lot about Jethro, and so I had to really dig in to all sorts of commentaries, to rabbinic literature, to all sorts of scriptures to get a proper understanding, and I probably did more research and digging deep Uh, And you guys get just a small taste of what I got to experience this week. Um, And so I'm getting teachy. I would encourage you, if you've got a notepad and a pen, pull it out. If you've got a phone, pull it out. Take notes. I hope that you would learn. It helps you stay engaged. Um, But teachy first, and then I promise I'll get preachy too. Exodus chapter 2, let me bring you up to speed of what's happening in our text. Moses is a big character in the Bible. He was born an Israelite. Now, an Israelite... Uh, is someone who is a direct descendant of Jacob. So we see in Genesis 17 that God promised Abraham that he would become the father of many nations. Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a son named Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So Jacob and Israel are the same person, two names. And anyone uh, born in the lineage of Jacob would be considered an Israelite. Jacob had 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. And so Moses is born an Israelite, meaning he is a direct descendant of Jacob or Israel. And he is born in Egypt. And during this time, the Israelites are under oppression from the Egyptians. They've been captive for over 400 years at this time. Pharaoh uh, was being threatened by the, the rising number of Israelites being born, and so he ordered that all the baby boys born of Hebrew children or of the Israelites be thrown into the river to be killed, but baby girls could live. Um, Moses' mom hid him for the first three months of his life and then realized, I can no longer hide this, this three-month-old crying, colicky child, and in a desperate attempt to save Moses' life, built a basket made out of reeds, placed him in the river, and Pharaoh's daughter, 
the princess of Egypt, finds this basket, takes pity on Moses, and calls for a Hebrew woman to raise this child and, and to, to feed this child. The woman that got summoned and got called happened to be Moses' biological mother. So Moses' biological mother raised her until, raised Moses until he was weaned. And then for the first time in scripture, we see adoption happening in a foreign culture where after he was weaned, the princess of Egypt, the daughter of Pharaoh, adopted Moses, and Moses continued to grow up in Pharaoh's household. He finished growing up there, and one day he saw an Egyptian man beating an Israelite. Moses thought that nobody was looking. He killed the Egyptian, and he buried him in the sand. And Pharaoh caught wind of this, and he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled to a place called Midian, where he meets our character today, Jethro. Would you stand with me as we read our scriptures in Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 15? When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian where he sat down by a well. Now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flock. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to Reuel, their father... He asked him, why have you returned so early today? So let me pause for a minute. If you're confused as to why Jethro is referred to as Raul and Hobab, let me bring some clarity because uh, sometimes someone might look at that and say, oh, the Bible's not accurate. There's errors in the Bible. This is, this is not an accurate, reliable source. This is very accurate and very reliable source. It was not uncommon for men to have two different names. Hobab and Jethro were two very common names in the Midianite tribe. And so it's very possible that, and likely, and it was, that Jethro had two names, Jethro and Hobab, and he may have gone by both. Some of you might get called by your middle name. I've gone to the hospital and I've said, is Kathy so-and-so here? I'm sorry, we don't have a Kathy in here. And she goes to find out by her middle name, but she really has a different name. Reuel literally means friend of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, friend of God. All right, you are friend of God. It, it means friend of God or shepherd of God. And, and we see that he was a priest. And so the author, Moses, of this book is writing and referring to Jethro's position and not his name. Many of you call me pastor. I don't know if that's because you don't know if I'm Pastor Luke or Pastor Zach or Pastor Austin and you're just going to give the safe bet. I know you're a pastor, so you call me pastor. But you're referring more to my title than as to my name. So the fact that Jethro is referred to as Hobab, Jethro, and Raul is not an issue. And I hope that clears some understanding up of why he's referred to as different um, names. Let's read on. They answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds, and he even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he? Raul asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zephora to Moses in marriage. Zephora gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I have become a foreigner in a foreign land. You may be seated. Now let me point something out. Despite being an Israelite, despite Moses being born a Hebrew, full-blood child, Jethro's daughters identified Moses as being an Egyptian. Could it have been his dress and his garb? Possibly. Could it have been his accent? Maybe. But I think growing up, for me, I always kind of had Moses on this level, assuming that as soon as he was in the desert, he was just a spiritual giant. But after reading and studying this text, I'm not so sure that Moses was as strong in his faith as we might give him credit at this point in the story. Imagine living in a polytheistic culture for over 400 years. Now polytheistic or polytheism is simply the belief in and worship of many gods. In Egypt, they had a God for everything. The God of sun, the God of rain, the God of fertility, the God of this and the God of that. This is the, the um, condition or the culture that Moses had grown up for and his ancestors and his grandparents and great-grandparents for 400 years had been living in a polytheistic culture. And imagine with me that the God of your great-great-great-great-grandfather Abraham has mainly been silent while you are being oppressed by the Egyptians in this time. It's possible that Moses had some good spiritual roots established by his mother, but I'm personally convinced that a 
combination of living both in a polytheistic culture and growing up and being raised in Pharaoh's household muddied his understanding of who God is. See, we forget that before Jesus sent the Holy Spirit of God to earth, people needed a personal encounter with God to to actually know him. Moses may have known about God, but Moses hadn't had that personal encounter where he actually knew God. Best case scenario, the Israelites at this point might be considered henotheistic. Henotheism is the belief that there are many gods, but you choose to favor one God and mainly worship that God. In a lot of ways, you guys seen those coexist bumper stickers and the, the movement of coexist. In a lot of ways, coexist is henotheism in today's uh, culture. We believe in multiple gods. You have your favorite. I have my favorite. I'll worship mine. You worship yours, right? And this is supported. If you've been in Israel, uh, the first uh, temple that I visited when I went to Israel, there was a main worship area where the main prominent god uh, was worshipped, but then in the side part of the temple, there were all sorts of other gods. Up until this point, the Israelites were struggling with henotheism. They were struggling with polytheism. They were struggling with identifying Yahweh as being the true, sole, one, and only God. That's why when Moses got the law, thou shalt worship thy Lord and thy God alone, right? He's correcting where they're at in this this. Uh, mindset. Monotheism is the belief that uh, there is one God and we worship that one God alone, right? Monotheism uh, and people that are monotheistic, as Wave Nunley says, are the worst because it's their way or the highway. There is no room for error. There is no opinion. It's him and him alone. That's what Christians are. That's what you and I are. We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. We are monotheistic. So I think this theory of Moses being henotheistic and the Israelites at this time being henotheistic is supported in the next chapter where God, uh, or Moses encounters God at the burning bush. God calls Moses back to Egypt and says, I'm gonna use you to deliver all of the Israelites, all of my people out of captivity. And in chapter three, verse 13 of Exodus, it says, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell him? Right there, Moses doesn't know the name of God. That's clearly God in a burning bush that's not burning up. It's clearly God. He doesn't know his name. And what he's saying is the Israelites aren't going to immediately recognize the God of their fathers as Yahweh. They're going to be like, okay, God sent you, but which God? Moses needed an encounter with God to actually know him. And now all of that background is very important because it ties in to what we know about Jethro. So we're going to pause on Moses and we're going to get to our main character, Jethro. Turn to your neighbor and say, thank the Lord, he's moving on, right? What do we know about Jethro? We know that he's referred by Jethro, Hobab, and Reuel. We, we, we know he had seven daughters and was a priest of Midian. We see him welcome in the alien. We see him welcome in the foreigner. We see him even give one of his daughters to this foreigner, Moses. And looking through other passages in rabbinic literature, we know that Jethro was a Midianite. But even more specific to that, he was a Kenite, which is like a tribe of Midianites. The uh, Kenites were mainly nor nomadic and they were shepherds and metal workers. You say, why is this important? Why do I need to know? Well, um, if, if uh, someone were to ask you, are you American or are you Texan? You know, to my dad. Depending on the day, he might say, well, I'm Texan. Well, depending on the day when Jethro says, what are you? Are you uh, a Midian or a Kenite? It's, it's one and the same. Midians is like uh, the Americans right? And then we each have states where the Kenites might be like a local tribe of that uh, overarching theme of America. Does that make sense? I just made that really muddied. But this is why it, it, this is relevant. Midianites were a descendant of Abraham through his second wife, Keturah. Okay? Some of you might not even know that Moses or that Abraham had a second wife. But Keturah and Abraham had six sons, and one of them was named Midian, which is how the Midianites originated. Now remember that God promised Abraham that he would be a father of many nations. And so in the same way that Moses grew up probably knowing about God, Jethro grew up probably knowing about God too because his descendant 
was Abraham. Abraham worshipped God, and he had a son named Midian, and the Midianites originated from Midian. And so as time and generation goes on, worshiping the true God got more and more and more muddied where they eventually become henotheistic. And so similar to Moses, Jethro may have known about God but not worshiped him exclusively. He was probably henotheistic. I think Exodus 18 verses 9 through 12 supports this. Jethro was delighted to hear about all the good things that the Lord had done for Israel in rescuing from the hand of the Egyptians. Jethro said, praise be to the Lord who rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians and of Pharaoh who rescued the people from the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know, here it is, verse 11, out of the horse's own mouth. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all other gods, for he did this to those who had treated Israel arrogantly. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, brought a burnt offering and other sacrifices to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat a meal with Moses' father-in-law in the presence of God. So after seeing and hearing what God had done for the Israelites, Jethro proclaims, Yahweh, you are greater than all other gods. I'm going to choose to worship you. And he brings these burnt sacrifices. He gets with the Israelite leaders and he essentially says, my people, the Kenites, the Midianites, we are going to join with you because we recognize that you serve the God of all gods, the name above all other names. Jethro goes and he integrates. And we see at this point where the Kenites integrate and they intermarry with the Israelites. And many scholars believe that the Kenites shared their knowledge of metalwork with the Israelites, that they may have helped the Israelite army actually become more dominant in that Bronze Age time period. Jethro's declaration as Yahweh being the only God is a big reason as to why the Midianites are saved. Not just spiritually saved, but also saved years later from destruction. In 1 Samuel 15, King Saul at this point gets instructed from the Lord to go and destroy the Amalekites. And in verses 5 and 6, it says this, Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. Then he said to the Kenites, go away and leave the Amalekites so I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. Jethro changed the Kenites' destiny. Because he said, your God will be my God, because he inter, um, entered into the Israelites' um, religion and, and, and intermarried with them, he has saved them, not just spiritually, but from the matter of fact of actually existing. We also know that Jethro was a wise man. He helped develop and shape Moses. And in Exodus 18, he helps Moses restructure the ways that the disputes were happening among the Israelites. He implored Moses to teach the Israelites the correct way to live, and he was respected, highly respected, amongst both his people, the Midianites and the Kenites, and the Israelites. So turn to your neighbor and say, that's a lot. Is he done yet? I just gave you a lot of information, and you're probably sitting there thinking, how does this all relate to me? How in, how in the world, what, what do I have that I can take away from all this information that, I, that he just spewed at me. I think that a lot of us here this morning might relate more to Jethro and Moses and the Israelites than we might like to admit. It's easy to say that we worship God and God alone, but truly ask yourself this morning, how devoted are you really to God? Have you slipped into henotheism where you acknowledge God and you prefer God, but you've allowed other things in your life to steal your worship, your time, your attention, your devotion. If someone were to go to your house and search it with a fine comb, would they find things that honor God? If someone were to track your finances, would they see your finances advancing the kingdom of God? If someone were to record and follow you around and record your every conversation, would it be evident that you love God and that you love others? Based upon your ability to forgive, is it evident that God is giving you a supernatural ability to do so? When was the last time that you prayed for more than five minutes? 
I'm talking like really dug in and prayed. Waited until God, you had an encounter with God just sat and just waited and just were not content until you had God speak to you. When was the last time that you really interceded for your family, for your children and your grandchildren? Nicole's right. The word of God is true. This is a spiritual battle. When was the last time? When was the last time you cracked open the word of God and you allowed it to speak and refine your life? Feeling uncomfortable yet? Because in preparing this sermon, I experienced extreme discomfort. When I got my test results back and found out that I was positive for COVID, I knew that the following few weeks were going to be really tough being quarantined to my house. And I like routine. I do best in routine. I've kind of got my day set out and how I get to the office and how I start and how I finish. I, I, I wanted to be at youth camp. Youth camp was just a week away and, and uh, I, I wanted to be there. I wanted to serve Zach and Luke in whatever capacity. I wanted to see young kids' lives just being impacted and completely wrecked by God in a good way. I wanted to be a part of that. I, I wanted to be in church. I wanted to be around people. I, I knew that it was going to be a difficult task to, to not be with people. But looking back on my time in quarantine, I have mixed emotions about it. In one way, I ex- loved it. Like, it, it was great. I got to spend so much time at home. I was able to, to tackle a couple projects. I power washed my entire deck with my rinky-dinky little power washer that shoots a one-inch or two-inch little bead. It took me forever, and I got sunburned, and it was awesome. I spent so much time with my kids and Elizabeth. We laughed. We went on family bike rides. We played games, and it was great in many regards. In other ways, it wasn't great spiritually. I had the opportunity where my pace of life slowed down, and I could have spent more time with God, and I didn't take advantage of it. Instead, every night after my kids went to bed, I watched two episodes of a Survivor show called Alone. I barely read or studied my Bible. I would tune into services and watch services, but I wouldn't really push through, and I wasn't really intentional and engaging in worship. I didn't pull out my notebook and Bible. Maybe you're watching this morning, and and you're like, wow, you're kind of speaking to me this morning. I didn't spend much time in in prayer. I just kind of existed those two weeks spiritually. I noticed just how easy it was in those short two weeks to live a life that revolved around me and my family. And it's not that I lost my salvation. It's not that I loved God less in those moments. It's not that God loved me less or I lost favor with God or anything. But it opened my eyes to see just how easy it is to become distracted and allow other things to take my attention and take my worship from my creator and my savior. Maybe you're you're watching or you're listening and you can relate right now. You haven't been sowing into your faith as you know you should be. Can I just encourage us all, let's do this. We need God to rekindle the fire in our hearts, to light the flame again. Ask God for a hunger and a thirst of righteousness. Ask God for a desire to be in his word. Ask God for a desire to be in his presence. Let him just place just a a spirit of of, um, persistence in your heart where you wouldn't accept no or that was okay, but you are fighting to get into the inner courts to sit in the very presence of the Prince of Peace. We need a move of God in our lives. As the musicians come and we sing a song in complete and total surrender, we sing a song just inviting God to move in a mighty way. Would you just open up your heart to what the Spirit of God is speaking to you? I believe that God is speaking to you individually, but also to us collectively as a whole. I believe that there are some Jethro's in the house this morning. I believe that there are some men and women here this morning that you know about God, but you haven't 
encountered him and you don't really know him. Or it's been so long since you've pushed through and encountered him that your understanding of worship and where you're at with him needs a little bit of a refresh and a reset. I believe that there's people here needing a revelation, needing an encounter. And guess what? God wants to give you that more than anything else. In the same way that God used Jethro to eternally impact and shape the destiny of his family and his nation, God wants to use you. This is eternity we're talking about. That's at stake. This is nothing to be taken lightly. Your complete and total and obedience or lack thereof could affect generations to come. You see Jethro say, we are going to worship. My people, we're going to worship Yahweh. And we see that entire nation, the Midianites, the Canaanites, they are saved spiritually, but even more so, they're saved from destruction later on. Do you realize that your whole devotion to God affects more than just you? If you can't see the evident degradation and, and just fall of, of fervency for the Lord over your grandparents and your parents and where you're at and where your kids are, man, it's going to happen. It is happening. We have become way too lax as believers. Ask yourself, what platform has God given you to change the destiny of others? Are you a father? Are you an aunt? Are you a friend? Are you a businessman or woman? Are you a teacher? God wants to use you. You don't have to be a major character, but you do play a major role. Would you stand across this room? Bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're here this morning and you'd say, Austin, I relate to a lot of what you're talking about. I've got some work to do. I, I need more of Jesus in my life. I'm, I might not know all of what needs to change right now, but I'm acknowledging that God is speaking to me and I'm saying that I'm listening. I'm open to whatever God wants to do in and through my life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I just want to be able to pray for you, just saying I need to just step up. Yeah, so many. God, help us. Help us, Jesus. Lighten us a fire and a passion, God, to live for you and you alone. I pray that your Holy Spirit as described as a fire would come and rest on our lives and it would burn up everything that doesn't matter and it would leave only the things that matter, Lord, where we would worship you in spirit and in truth, God. When you call us, we will go. Where you tell us to do, go and, and what to do, we are there for you because you are what matters, Lord. I pray, God, right now that you would place a deep desire and rekindle a fire in our hearts so that we can pray for our loved ones, that we can eternally change the destiny of our family members, God, of the wayward son or the wayward daughter, of our friends, God, that are lost. They're great people. They are awesome people, but they need you. I pray, God, that you would stir in us, stir in us, Jesus, the ability to do it, God. Let this not be an emotional response. May this be an encounter, God, where we we would see your face, where we would know you fully, where we would experience you in a way that can only change the direction of our life, Lord. Help us, Jesus. Help us, God. We surrender and we trust you. And like a mighty wind, Just pray that you'd begin to move. With every eye closed, I just want to give the opportunity to anyone here today that they've never asked Jesus to be Lord and Savior of your life. You know 
that if you were to die today, that you haven't made it right with Jesus. I want to say that God sees you, that there's nothing that you've done that is too great for him to forgive, but he is standing with arms wide open and he wants to overwhelm you with the greatest presence that you have ever experienced, a presence of joy and freedom and forgiveness and love and comfort and peace. If that's you and you just say, Austin, I'm asking Jesus into my life to forgive me of my sins, to put my feet on a path that would honor him. Would you just raise your hand with every eye closed and head bowed out of respect? Yes. Is there anyone else? Jesus, I pray right now, God, that this individual, Lord, would completely trust you, Lord. That she would let go she would let go of her plans. She would let go of the past. She would hold on to you. I pray that you would forgive her of her sins. That you would enter her heart. You'd create a desire to be in your presence, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for her soul. I pray that she would experience peace right now, knowing that she is right with you. You'd surround her with people that can encourage her, love her, and point her to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God, I pray for everyone here this morning, everyone watching online, that our lives would reflect what we just say. That we would completely surrender, and that because we want to know you more, we would take steps towards you, Lord, and feel your love, feel you just embrace us, God. I pray, Lord, for just the personal times of devotion. As we open up your word, that you'd reveal yourself, God, that you'd make yourself known, that we would encounter you. We wouldn't wait for Sundays. We wouldn't wait for Bible studies. We would encounter you and know you in a personal experience. In Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to leave you with this thought. I was talking with Pastor Luke yesterday as we were driving back from uh, an event with our graduated seniors. I was kind of talking through my sermon with him, and he shared how when he was a senior in college, he was reading the story in Exodus 18 that I read the passage where Moses shared all that the Lord had done to Jethro. And it simply spoke to him at that point Luke, I want you to go speak to your grandfather. Now, Luke's grandfather was not a believer. He'd been very hard and calloused towards it. I don't want you to preach, Luke. I just want you to share what God has done in and through your life. I just want to share the goodness that you've experienced. So Luke and his sister Lexi and his dad Lee went to his grandfather and just simply shared what God had done in his life. And that day... His grandfather prayed the sinner's prayer with Pastor Luke simply because Luke just shared what the Lord had done for him. Who do you need to share with what God has done for you? Jesus, I pray, God, that we would be obedient, that we would be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, that we wouldn't feel responsible for people, but we would just be obedient to you. God, our reward is not in our results. Our reward will be in heaven as we cross that finish line and you say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Bless everyone here this morning. May your face shine upon them. May they know you and encounter you. In Jesus' name, amen.